Hello, hello, my name is Leo and welcome to a new tutorial by Blau Films. Right now, I'm quickly gonna be working on the close up version of Thinker. We have the wide shot of Thinker that we've done in tutorial part 11. We have done receiver in the wide shot in tutorial part 12. This is actually gonna be pretty easy, so I thought I would include the tracking part of the tutorial just to make this tutorial somewhat interesting. Before we start, be sure to check out the ArtStation store, link will be in the description below. I've got a bunch of assets from industrial decals to some safety stickers. These are probably going to come in handy during the interior sequences for syntactic labyrinths, but then for the exterior sequences, that's where the cool stuff comes, like the organic star fields. I'm going to keep pushing this product because I just think it's so cool and nobody really cares about the stars. I've got the footage into a new sequence. Thank you to Tomas Posada for the real shot. I'm gonna add a track in Boris Mocha effect to it. And the cool thing is here that people have been asking me what is a good tracking marker. And the idea is that all of these are tracking markers. So this big thing as a whole is one tracking marker, but the small dot in the middle, the plus, all of those things are tracking markers on their own. And the reason why there's so many on there is so you can kind of pick and choose whichever works best for the contrast ratio of your shot. So here I'm just going to be taking this plus, selecting it, and then down here I want to go for small motion. The reason I'm choosing small motion is because the shot didn't move. We are shooting a locked off shot. So the only thing that's really going to be moving is the shakiness of the internal shutter of the camera and just the wobbly nature of that we constructed this set on top of two tables. Weirdly enough, it actually helps. It makes it look as if you're in space or as if you're moving into something. But, you know, let's track these. Small motion, track forward, and I'll get back to you whenever we have a track. All right, we've got our tracking data, and I have already exported that data to this null object. The way you do that is with your footage selected, and your Mocha AE over here, you go to tracking data, create track data. And then if you have multiple trackers here, you would have multiple layers. You just select the one you want, hit OK. Then you would have your tracking data here, which you can then export either as a corner pin or as a transform data. And then you layer export that to the null object. I have just gone for transform data because there's nothing shifting. A corner pin would be something you would use for a TV screen that's moving in perspective. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select the layer, go to Distort, Bezier Warp, and I'm going to give it a 40 on each of the vertices. So the top two, you want to give it 40, and then the bottom two, you want to give it negative 40. The reason I'm doing this is that I know that this is going to be a crop shot afterwards and this is just going to be making sure that we have a bit more of the information of the room inside of here. So now we can go up here to composition settings and change the height to be what we want. Cool. And now it's time to import some of our close up renders. I'm going to be dragging in the first close up render. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. It's not completely positioned right. Let's just move it a touch. Wow, we actually fully cover it. Does that mean we don't actually have to do any of the backplane cleaning? So don't take this from me. Definitely do your background cleaning. I'm just not going to do it in this tutorial, but I'll do a separate tutorial for that. Now I'm going to be adding the multipass, which now the one thing we have to do is to make sure that we get these always in the same position. So actually I'm going to be deleting that and duplicating the bottom layer. And then with alt or option selected on your keyboard, you can drag the multi one from the project window on top of this one. And it has just replaced it. Now we're going to go to effect, 3D channel, and then extractor. This is going to give you all these layers inside of it. I'm just going to be making one duplicate of the background for each one of these passes. And then we'll, we'll kind of continue from there. All right, got all the passes over here. I'm just going to be playing with the hierarchy real quick. 
I would like to have the caustics at the bottom. Then I would like to have the light select on top of that. The bloom and glare can go on top of that. And the Z depth, I actually want to have underneath the bloom and glare. Now thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, I would like to have this order. The caustics are going to be playing with the glass. The light select is going to be the whole body. The Z depth is going to get us the correct blur and depth of field. And then the bloom and glare is just going to be sitting on top of everything, kind of blending it all together. All right, let's start with the caustics. You can't really see much in the caustics, but you have to set it to add first of all. And then we're just going to be doing a toggle on and off. It's a very subtle value, but I actually think I'm going to stick to the subtle value in this thinker close up. Let me add a exposure effect and just bring it up a little bit. All right, let's keep it there. So as you can see, the light select is really only touching the top light over there. When we set it to add, it's brightening everything up. So what I would like to do is add a exposure effect as well and then bring down the gamma. Now, what that's doing is we're basically going to be excluding most of the other values. So we only kind of stay with the top brightness. As you can see, we've kind of completely eliminated everything here at the bottom. Next comes the Z depth. We actually don't need to turn that on. You can look at it. It's pretty cool, but you don't really need it. I'm going to be adding a layer new adjustment layer and I'm setting that right below the Z depth. Now I'm taking the adjustment layer and adding a camera lens blur effect. And then with the blur map layer selected, we can go and select the Z depth layer. If you guys in the comments could tell me why sometimes you have to invert the blur map to get it right, or sometimes you don't, I'm not sure. I feel like it's kind of inconsistent with whether it inverts the map or not. I'm going to change the aspect ratio to 0 0.5 and the roundness to about 80. And then I'm going to be lowering the blur to about 2. I'm going to be turning on repeat edge pixels to get rid of some of these pixels at the bottom. Cool. Next thing, bloom and glare. I'm turning that on and setting it to add. It is looking nice, but the values are not exactly what I'm after. So I'm just going to be adding a exposure effect and I'm going to be bringing it down a little bit. When I say that these are not the values that I'm after, this is based on just doing this over and over again and having worked with Eric and having worked with Adon, just asking opinions from both sides, both from the cinematography and the lighting side. How are we telling the story? But also asking Adon, what do you feel about the shot? And is it too dark? Is it too bright? And that way we kind of built together on what this character and receiver on the other side, what they actually look like and what they're supposed to feel like. If you have someone who can give you their input, uh, don't be hesitant. I wouldn't like necessarily say go ask for feedback to everyone you know, but the people who you trust in your team and in your production, definitely, you know, ask them and they'll definitely be able to help you out. So what I would like to do now is I'm going to drag all of these and parent them to the null object. I'm going to be turning on motion blur over here and I'm just going to be adding motion blur to these layers over here. Now the next thing I would like to do is I'm going to pre-compose all of these layers. I'm going to drop into here, select all of them and pre-compose them again. Now inside of here, I would like to inside of the pre comp we just made, let's wait, let's organize this a little bit. So we have this pre comp, which is thinker close up. And then inside we have this pre comp we just made, which is thinker close up center. And if you already know what we're doing, we're going to be repositioning this shot. So I'm turning on the title action here. There you go. This button. And I'm going to be moving Thinker to be somewhat back to the center. I don't want this perfect mechanical center match. Uh, it's not really what I'm feeling, but somewhere here, maybe a little bit more off center. That's feeling fine. And now I'm going to be turning on this one. And here we go. Something super simple, dragging some kind of mask like this. And then I'm going to be V. And let's drag this point out. Do you all know how Bezier curves work and Bezier arms? If you don't, leave a comment below. It's a quick tutorial to make, so, you know, I'm glad to help. 
I'm gonna be putting the feather to about 100. Might be a bit too much. Might not be. Uh. Now, because this is essentially the same plate, we don't really have to play too much with the coloring. It's a fall off into nothingness, so you're pretty good to go. If you're working with some slightly more complicated footage and you're trying to composite this in, I actually have a few shots in the film where we do a full turnaround of the room and that's gonna be projection mapping. So I'm gonna be doing a tutorial on that soon. It's probably, pff, I don't know when I'm doing it, probably like in a week or two. All right, let's go into the thinker center composition one more time. And now let's add a little bit of the dust particles going in front and just like some tiny details to make this look more realistic in the close-up. I have copied these dust particles from the previous project files. There are basically some dust assets from actionvfx.com and then I have masked them out into position. I just essentially want these little specks. That's the only thing I'm looking for. And then I've added an exposure effect to really get that down to only the specs and a camera lens blur set to 0 0.5, but I'm going to be lowering the blur radius now because we're closer by. So our depth of field should not be that different. Here you go. Now I'm just going to be moving this asset a bit in time because we've used some of this area for the previous shot. I'm going to connect the dust particles to the null object as well. That way they're going to be moving with our track. The main thing I want to try doing now is adding some kind of heat outlet going on the top with a few small particles. This is something that we weren't able to see in the wide shot anyways, but for the close up, I feel like it's, it's a thing that's worth trying out. So I have a duplicate of the dust particles that I have just selected and dragged up to this part. I'm going to be lowering the camera lens blur to be one and I'm going to be drastically lowering the exposure. What I really want is just some particles showing up. Now I want to add an invert effect to this and this is going to make everything white, but I want to set that to multiply. Here we go. We have a few little particles flying there. Um, let's see, are we at the correct depth of field? I think so. Underneath this dust layer and above the other one, I'm going to add a adjustment layer and I'm going to add a solid. The solid can be any color because we're going to be adding a classic After Effects effect, fractal noise. What I would like to do is lower the complexity to be about one. There you go. And now I'm going to be dropping down this transform option over here and I'm going to be scaling it down to about 40 or 30. Somewhere here looks pretty good. I think it needs to be a little bit bigger. Let's give it about 70, 80. Cool. And now I'm going to be adding a blur effect. A fast box blur is really fine for these things. The only thing that I'm trying to do is get rid of that steppy edge and then a color correction exposures effect. We can bring down the gamma and then increase the exposure a bit. Next, what I would like to do is animate this thing moving upwards. So I'm going to be animating the offset. I can select this. Let's say we go for 10 seconds. I'm going to be moving the Y position down, which means the whole thing is going to be moving upwards. I think it should be moving relatively quickly. So let's do a quick preview and see how fast it's going. So this is definitely moving too slow, in my opinion because the air would be going up. Hmm. Okay, hold on. I'm going to be increasing the speed a bit more. So let's bring it down twice as high. I'm just quickly going to play that back on quarter resolution. Now I'm going to be alt clicking or option clicking the evolution. I'm going to be typing in time times 150. That should be enough. There you go. Now that's going to be giving all the changes to this fractal. All right. I'm going to be duplicating the entire layer. And now I'm going to be increasing the complexity to about three. And I'm going to be decreasing the scale to about 25. I can then 
lower the gamma and increase the exposure just to get a bit more contrast out of this. All right, and I'm gonna be decreasing the blur radius to be about 10. Now I'm gonna be setting this to screen or I could be setting that to add. That's a bit strong, but we can lower the exposure then. There you go. What I'm really trying to get are some of these strings in between the big fractal and then together they can kind of fluctuate fractally and just give more a bit more of a dynamic nature to the shot. What I would like to do is go into the evolution and just change a little bit the timing over here. Give that something like time times 180 just so it moves slightly out of sync with the other and give a bit more visual interest to it. All right, now with these two selected, I'm gonna go pre-compose. We have a new layer that we can work with. I'm gonna be turning on the bottom layer of Thinker just so we know where to look. I'm gonna be adding a distort turbulent displays. Turbulent is fine. The size could be smaller, something like 30. The evolution, we're gonna give that a time times 200 just to give it a little bit of a jitter that's going on to everything. The amount, as you can see, this is kind of what it's doing, but we don't want that. We want a subtle kind of jitter that goes on top of everything. And then let's go for a CC lens effect. Increasing the size until, yeah, somewhere here. I think this is what I'm after. Let's go to OK, and now let's make a bit of a mask right here. I'm selecting the bottom point, and I'm going to be moving it inwards a bit. As you can see, the mask is not overriding the CC lens effect, so that's why you're getting a shape that's not exactly accurate to your mask. And now what you would like to do is really bump the contrast here, because you don't want so many of these gray values. All right, we're moving it in a bit more. I would like to take this moment to say thank you very much for watching this video. If you're still watching, thank you. This is great. I'm excited to see that people care about this to some extent. So, you know, thank you. Yeah, there you go. That's looking fine. That's looking cool. What we can do now is just pre-compose this one more time if we want to, and then just add a mask around the edge of thinker here you go now the adjustment layer we have underneath i'm going to be turning that on just looking at the result i'm actually going to be replacing the camera lens blur effect with something more simple like a gaussian blur effect because it really doesn't seem to make too much of a difference in this case i'm also going to go into this layer and i'm going to be increasing the bright area there you go and now back to our layer, we should get a bit more of a blur going on. All right, here we go. One more playback and we're pretty much good to go. Now, the next thing I would like to do is go all the way in into this layer where we originally tracked the footage and back to Mocha AE. I would like to export the inverted tracking data. So I'm going to go to new null object, I've got null three over here, and then I'm going to invert the tracking data by clicking invert over here. And then I'm going to select null number three, apply export. Cool. Now in here, I'm just going to check off the scale because I don't feel like we need that. And this is basically a stabilized version of the original track mat. Now what we can do is take the entire null three, copy that, turn it off in this layer just so we have a copy from it, and then go all the way to this comp over here, pre-compose all of them together, and command V paste in null object number three. Now by tracking those together, basically if I put that to quarter resolution, you'll see we have essentially stabilized that shot. So what I would like to do now is I'm going to hit U on the null object so we get both of these keyframes and then I'm going to alt click and I'm going to type in smooth something like 0.3 and then let's say comma 5 and then I'm going to do the same for 
the rotation 0.3 comma 5 so as you can see what it has done it has basically taken the tracking data that we got initially and then have re-offset it back to be stabilized and now it's smoothing out the amount that it's stabilizing so essentially think of we're subtracting one and then adding one and then instead of adding one let's say we're we're adding 0 0.8 now so we're still getting the smoothness, but we're still getting the jitteriness and you can kind of control both of them by just playing around with the smooth value inside of the new null object. All right, so the next thing I would like to do is with that final composition selected, I'm gonna be adding just some really, really final post-processing on top. I'm going to be selecting some of these layers I've made before and then I'm going to be running through them. All right, on the bottom we have a vibrance effect. The only thing that's doing is giving us a bit more color in the core of Thinker. The next layer is an adjustment layer with an exposure effect that is particularly made to make Thinker look a bit darker. The thing is Thinker is a relatively simple design because it's essentially just one shape if this wasn't the case if we were working with something more complicated I would export an object ID to make the same thing happen I'm now gonna be copying the mask and onto the next layer I'm gonna be using the same mask but set to subtract and that's gonna be the color correction for the environment as you see we just darkened the gamma a little bit of the environment and then we're gonna have to increase a bit more everything to get it to the level of the other shots then I have this rounded rectangle over here set to subtract with a very high feather and a exposure effect that's just vignetting everything around it making that shot a bit more focused and then we have a CC radial blur that also has a nice feather and that's just fogging out the edges of the shot a little bit. Finally, we have some film grain that's going to go right on top. And that's just going to be compositing most of those details back together. There you go. Now, what I feel is that this shot is still a little bit dark. And we're going to be playing with these two layers. The one with thinker and the one with the background. I'm quickly going to be doing a comparison between this and the wide shot of Thinker that we've already got rendered. So as you can see, there's a big light difference. To be fair, Thinker itself seems to be color matching quite nicely. It's really just the background. So let's go for that. I'm going to be going in and in and in and in even more. And then let's just color correct the background. Going to be adding a exposure effect bring it up. Let's compare and contrast again. Yeah, that seems to be about it. That seems to be about it. All right, cool. That's it. Thank you very much for watching. So we got one more shot down for Syntactic Labyrinth. We have 94 shots total to finish for this film to finally get this film out. We have three shots down for the Think Ram Receiver sequence and I hope you're excited for the next video. We're going to be compositing some more. Everything that I haven't covered in one of those videos, you will be able to tell me in the meantime. So thank you all for the support. I'm excited to share more of the process of Syntactic Labyrinth. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to like the video. Be sure to check out the ArtStation store. Be sure to support our films by buying all of our assets. Be sure to buy assets for your friends who don't have money. Be sure to buy the assets for your friends who are in a project and are getting money at some point but are not ready right now to do a purchase. Be sure to get it for your dad, your friends, your sisters, everyone who is trying to get into filmmaking. And that's it. And on my part, that's my ad. And uh, hope you have a good day. Bye-bye. Cheers.